Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. This is now the fourth video in the series on load line analysis. In the first video, I laid the foundations for understanding what is going on as we proceed through this process. Now, if you missed that video, I've put a link up in the corner and down in the description for your convenience. In the second video, I walked through this process of setting up the DC and AC load lines for a very simple common emitter transistor circuit with a capacitively coupled load on its output. Now, if you missed that one, there's a link up in the corner and down in the description for that one too. In the last video, the third in this series, I took this one step further with a bit more complex example, which is more in keeping with what you might see. I developed the DC and AC load lines for this beta-stabilized common emitter transistor circuit with a split emitter resistor. Now, just like the other two, I put a link to that video up in the corner and down in the description for your convenience. Now, in this video, I'm going to answer two very poignant questions. The first one is, what is the point of this whole load line analysis business anyway. The second one is, if the AC load line isn't so different than the DC load line, then why is the overall voltage gain of the circuit so totally different? Well, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. So let's get into our first question. Why even bother with all of this? So you might ask, what is the point of all of this? Well, let's begin with the AC load line that I developed in the last video. Suppose that you anticipate a change of base current which will swing from 5 microamps to 9 microamps. So we find the 5 microamp base current trace. We follow it to where it crosses the AC load line and make a dot there. Then we find the 9 microamp base current trace. We follow it to where it crosses the AC load line and we make yet another dot there. Now, draw vertical lines down from these two dots to the horizontal VCE axis. You can now read the anticipated collector emitter voltages from the horizontal axis. In this particular case, VCE swings from about 4.08 volts to 6.4 volts. So you can see that this process helps us discover the range of voltage swing available to us with this design. Now, it could be that the AC load line could end up being so very much different than the DC load line that we cannot achieve an adequate voltage swing on the output in one direction or another. This analysis helps us see that. We can also see by this analysis how far we might have to move the quiescent operating point to achieve the desired symmetrical voltage swing. So yes, there is a very practical reason for this analysis. Now, on to our next question. Well, the next question is, if the load line isn't so different, then why is the gain so different? In fact, the AC load line might indicate that the gain is lower, but the overall voltage gain of the circuit is dramatically higher. What's up with that? Well, to answer this, I'm going to use these two circuits. Now, they're both absolutely identical to one another. They have the same quiescent operating point. They're both beta stabilized. They have the exact same DC load line. They're absolutely identical to each other with one notable exception. The second one has a bypass capacitor across the emitter resistor. So what difference does that make? Well, the first circuit has a gain of 5. The second has a voltage gain of 192. The AC load line of the first is absolutely identical to its DC load line. And as you can see here, the AC load line of the second is somewhat different. Now, 
notice these two things. The AC load line is steeper with the second, meaning that the voltage gain would be lower, not higher. And the AC load line is not all that much different than the DC load line, at least not enough to make us believe that the second circuit has 38 times the voltage gain of the first. So the question that comes to mind, then why is the overall voltage gain of the circuit so dramatically different? Well, remember, the AC load line reflects the gain of the transistor from the perspective of the output side of the circuit. It does not show the overall gain of the entire circuit. The voltage gain of the entire circuit is dramatically different because of two aspects of transistor circuits that the AC load line and DC load line do not reflect. The first is that we have to remind ourselves that bipolar junction transistors are current operated devices. They respond to changes in base current and only indirectly to changes in base voltage. Second is the effects of the emitter resistor on the input resistance of the transistor. This effect makes a dramatic difference in the change in base current given a change in base voltage. The value of a transistor's input resistance, R pi, is equal to the thermal voltage, Vt, which is 0.026 volts at room temperature, divided by the quiescent base current. Well, in the case of both of these circuits, the quiescent base current is 7.5 microamps. So, R pi is equal to 0.026 divided by 7.5 microamps. This gives us an R pi of 3.467 k ohms. All right, let's take a look at the first circuit. We have this resistance, this 3.467 k ohms plus the effective resistance of the emitter resistor as seen from the base. The effective resistance of the emitter resistor is equal to the actual emitter resistor value times 1 plus the DC current gain beta. And because the DC current gain here is 200, this is 201 times the emitter resistor value. And so for this circuit, we get 201 times 663 ohms, giving us the effective resistance of the emitter resistor as seen from the base of 133.263 k ohms. Now, let's take a look at the second circuit. The capacitor essentially shorts out the emitter resistor from an AC perspective, so the total resistance of the second circuit is just well, R pi, or 3.467 k ohms. Now, let's consider putting an input signal into the base of each of these circuits of, let's say, uh, 0.01 volts, 10 millivolts. And so we ask, what is the change in base current with this change in voltage and these input resistance values? For the first circuit, Using Ohm's law, we would have 0.01 volts on the top divided by our 136.73 k ohms gives us a change in base current of 0.073 microamps. With a DC current gain of 200, we would see a change in the collector current of 14.6 microamps. Now, for the second circuit, we would have 0.01 volts on the top divided by R pi, 3.467 k ohms, giving us a change in base current of 2.884 microamps. This would give us a change in the collector current of 576.9 microamps. The change in collector current in the second circuit is 39 times that of the first circuit with the same change in input voltage. 
from the output side perspective, the gain actually dropped some. But we put this together with the difference on the input side, and we get the change overall gain of 38 times. Therein lie the reason for the massive difference in the voltage gain between the two circuits. Well, hopefully these four videos gave you the heads up on how to create both DC and AC load lines and maybe answered some other questions along the way. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots!